Uh, we've been walking the, the footsteps of Jesus. So I hope you brought your uh, passport, your toiletries, because today we go to Jerusalem. Over the last few decades, I've made many trips to the Holy Land. And on one occasion, we took a film crew uh, envisioning moments like this in which we could present a message uh, captured somewhere in the Holy Land. And today we have the privilege of going to one of those few places where we're absolutely certain Jesus stood. The southern steps outside of the where the temple used to be in Jerusalem. So far we focused on the region of Galilee. But now it's time for us to turn south and follow Jesus as he makes his way to the city of Jerusalem. Many Jewish travelers followed the course of the Jordan River until they reached the city of Jericho and there they turned west toward Jerusalem. A shorter route was available, but it led through Samaria. And Samaria was off limits, at least to most Jews. It wasn't to Jesus and that's where he met the Samaritan woman at a well. Pilgrims in the day of Christ would travel to Jerusalem to visit the temple. A model of the structure helps us appreciate its grandeur. It took 84 years to build, 84 years. But it was demolished by the Roman armies in AD 70. And all that remains is a portion of the retaining wall or the wailing wall as well as the temple steps or the southern steps. As we'll see in this message today, it was somewhere in the vicinity of the temple that Jesus revealed to a man by the name of Nicodemus. And Jesus revealed to him the identity of the Son of God. And it was a message that shook the world then, and it's a message that shakes the world, world still. Let's turn our attention to the screen. Two of our three daughters were born in the south zone of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We li yeah, we got a carioca here among us, yeah. We lived in the north zone, separated by our doctor's office, by a tunnel marked mountain range. And during those many months of, of pregnancy, we had to make the, the drive often, and we didn't complain. Those of you who know anything about Rio de Janeiro know it's, it's got charm uh, dancing the samba on every street corner. There's Sugarloaf Mountain, there's, there's Ipanema neighborhood, there's Copacabana Beach. I never begrudged those South Zone forays, but I certainly was confused by them. I am directionally challenged already. I literally can get lost in a hotel room going from the bed to the bathroom. I get confused easily, complicate my disorientation with ancient winding narrow roads and I, I didn't stand a chance. My only hope was Jesus. No, I mean literally Jesus, the Christ the Redeemer statue that stands overlooking the city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 90 feet tall with a, a wingspan of 163 feet, 1,320 tons of reinforced steel. The head alone measures 10 feet from chin to scalp. And it's perched a mile and a half above the sea level on a mountain called Corcovado. And a person can always, always in the south zone see the elevated Jesus, especially those who are looking and especially those who are lost. And since I was always lost, I was always looking because I could get my bearings. Once I could, oh, okay, 
there's the Christ the Redeemer statue. That means I'm north or south or, or east or west. Find him and I could find the hospital. Jesus gave me my bearings. Find Christ and I could find my way. Millions upon millions of people are saying the same. Many of whom have already been translated into paradise. Many of whom are still on the planet. And if our Lord tarries, many of whom are, are yet to be born. But we have found Christ and in doing so have found our way. And we do not believe that our life is it just a brief trip between a birth and the hearse. But we believe that we are here to make a decision, and that is what to do with Jesus Christ. The one who walked these steps was and is unlike any other of the billions upon billions of human beings that have ever lived. He made claims that either make him the hope or the hoax of mankind. He made claims that set him apart. He never claimed to be just like us, although he became one of us. He never kept his uniqueness a secret. And in one of the occasions that he was most clear about his uniqueness is in the most famous verse in the Bible. I'll start it. As you recognize it, you can chime in. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. At the heart of that verse is the heart of the claim of Jesus Christ. He claimed and claims to be the one and only Son. So one way to consider the uniqueness of Jesus is to consider this phrase, that he claimed and claims to be the one and only, one and only, the one and only Son. Allow me to get just a technical for just a moment it helps to know that one and only is a compound word in the Greek language. You'll find it helpful, monogenes, monogenes, M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S. You recognize the second part of the compound word as genes, genes, genetic uh, relationship. So what does this mean? Monogenes, one and only son. Well, monogenes highlights a singular relationship that Jesus, who walked these steps, had with God, the creator of the universe. You are a child of God. I am a child of God. But neither you nor I is a monogenetic child of God. Jesus alone is the one and only Son. Only Christ can be called monogenetic, one and only, because only Christ has the genetic makeup of God. Your children have your genetic makeup. You might put your arm around me and say, you're like a son to me, and I appreciate that, but I'm not your son. I'm not your, your child. I don't have your genetic makeup. I, I don't carry on your DNA. Jesus presented himself as the monogenetic, the one, in other words, everything, everything you could say about God, you could say about Jesus. So Jesus enjoys a relationship with God that is unprecedented and unexperienced by anyone in human history. He claims to enjoy the Christ, the Redeemer, perch, high above all. And we can thank Matthew for giving us more details about what this means. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27, Jesus said, my father has given me authority over everything. First of all, he presents Jesus as the one and only ruler, 
ruler. Jesus says, my father has given me authority over everything, over everything. There was a time in which a Roman officer sent a message to Jesus, asking Jesus to come and, and heal his servant. And Jesus went, but before he arrived at the home, uh, the master sent a servant to tell Jesus it's an unnecessary trip. You don't have to come. Listen to what he said. Just say the word from where you are. My servant will be healed. I know because I am under the authority of superior officers and I have authority over soldiers. I only need to say go. They go, come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this or do that. In other words, the officer says, I understand authority. I'm a part of the Roman Empire. I get it. I clear my throat and people stand up to listen. I get authority, and Jesus, you have authority. When the one in charge commands, the ones beneath obey. The soldier, in essence, says, Jesus, you call all the shots. And so you don't have to come. I mean, if you want to come, it's great, but I know you don't have to. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, as amazing as the words of the servant are the words of Jesus in reply. Jesus did not say, oh, you're overstating the case. Oh, you give me too much credit. He didn't say that. No, what he said was, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all the land of Israel. Jesus did not correct him. Just the opposite. Christ applauded him and said, oh, okay, here's faith. You want to know what faith is? Faith says, Jesus speaks, it happens. That's it. And Jesus says, well, I'm not seeing faith like this until I found this fellow here. He gets authority. There we see Jesus as the one and only authority of the universe. He then invites us to go further. He's not only the one and only ruler, but look at this. He's the one and only revealer. He's the one and only revealer. Jesus says, no one really knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. <laughs> Nobody knows God except Jesus. Nobody. We can't separate these pronouncements. We have to feel them as a couplet. No one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. So Jesus depicts an intimacy with God that no one else has had. Now, you couples get this to a degree. I know Deanland and I do. We just celebrated 40 years. We no longer converse. We communicate in code. <laughs> she'll see me in the kitchen making a sandwich, and I'll say, honey, and she'll say, no, I don't want one. I don't have to finish the sentence. I'll open the fridge, and I'll, I'll stand there and stare, as I do so often. And she'll look at me and look at the sandwich and she'll say the pickles are in the door where they have been for 40 years. <laughs> she knows my thoughts and she will complete what I say for me or she will say what I'm thinking for me. Consequently, Deanland has absolute authority to speak on my behalf. She does. If she says, you know, I don't think Max will like that, <laughs> she, she speaks with authority. When she says, oh, I think Max will want to go there, she knows. She knows. After four decades, she's lived with me as long as Moses had to put up with the wilderness. Can you imagine? <laughs> so she shares an intimacy, and I share one with her, unequaled with any other relationship. Jesus says that he shares an intimacy with God. Consequently, when he speaks, he speaks with authority. Please hear this. He claims to be not a top theologian, not an accomplished theologian, not even the supreme theologian. He claims to be the only theologian. He's the only theologian to ever live. Others have claimed to be, <laughs> but they're not. No one really knows the Father except the Son, he says. Nobody does. He has pedestrianed streets that no human being has walked. He has witnessed moments that no person will. 
Maybe this would help. You're a fifth grader studying astronomy. And the day you read about the first mission to the moon, you and your classmates begin to pepper your teacher with questions. What does moon dust feel like? Can you swallow when there's no gravity? What about going to the bathroom? Well, the teacher does the very best she can. She says, well, I think, or maybe, or perhaps, but she's unsure. I mean, how could she know? She's never been to the moon. And then in some amazing accomplishment, the next day she invites a guest to come into her classroom. One of the 12 people to have walked on the moon. And now you begin asking some questions and he speaks with authority. He speaks with conviction. He speaks with clarity. Why? He's been there. That's why the people uh, who heard Jesus teach on these very steps said he was teaching them as one who had authority. Oh, how can he speak with such confidence? In addition, the Holy Spirit was blessing his words and creating conviction in the hearts of the people. He knows the dimension of God's throne. He knows the fragrance of the incense. He knows the favorite song of the unceasing choir. You see, Jesus doesn't just boast in his knowledge. He shares it. He doesn't just gloat. He gives. He doesn't just revel. He reveals. He reveals to us the secrets of eternity. Now, we don't understand them all, but we can ask and we can seek them. And as he shares them, he shares them freely. And again, not just with the accomplished or the learned, but with anyone, with the hungry and the needy, which takes us to our key verse of the week. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle and you will find rest for your souls. Do yourself a favor. Find the brightest highlighter manufactured. Find the darkest ink ever produced and underscore, underline and accept his invitation. Let me teach you.